um, like the only book I read right now, which is Camera Lucida by Roland Bart. But mainly we're going to talk about one image that's coming of Dead Alley, this English player who's 22 years old. He's playing for the English squad for the first time. Um, this image is coming, it's amazing. I haven't saved on my phone, I've been talking about nothing but this image. So now I'm going to talk about it for about an hour. Um, but I'm going to start, oh, and by the way, this is going to be kind of annoying, but the slides don't work. Um, so I'm going to have to ask Katrina to like, change slides every time. So hi, Katrina, can you change this right now? Okay, so here's the slide from Cameron to see that, that I've been thinking about forever. Because the first man who saw the first photograph, if we accept me set, who made it, must have thought it was a painting. Same framing, same perspective. Photography has been, and still is, tormented by the ghost of painting. And now I'm really going to start. I'm going to start really romantically because I'm talking about football, something that can be really feminine and even wearing makeup. Um, so, chapter one of seven chapters of this talk is called Touch. Can we change sides? So, has anyone of you guys ever touched someone else and thought about her meaning? Specifically, the sculpture that I think about every single time I touch another human being. Can you change another side? Um, this, this. This is marble. The title of the sculpture is The Rape of Proserpina, Persephone, Persephone in Greek mythology, who is the goddess of the underground, who was abducted slash raped, is the word for it, by Pluto or Hades. Um, who thought that she was so beautiful that she needed her underground. She just couldn't imagine that she would be overground. Um, in the sculpture, her knee obviously captures the moment of the abduction, that grip. And I think about this all the time. This is marble. This is this cold, hard thing. And every time I touch a warm other body, I think about this coldness. The violence on the side, just the fact that this has this like, amazing tension and amazing tenderness in it. Here's a simpler example to how I always see art history in day to day life. Did any one of you guys ever walk in the landscape and thought about this part of the Friedrich or Monet or Claude Lelouin? Um, the history of art mediates the way that we see the world. This is a talk about that, about how we see art in the world around us. But it's also about what artworks it is that we think about or that we bring into our mind when we're walking through a landscape or speaking with someone. And this idea of art is something that we always see in everywhere around the world around us. But this is especially a talk about football. And because it's about football, it's about time and memory, about the gap between the decisive moment and the moments that precede it and about how we experience the world through representation. This talk begins with the footballer celebrating a goal, and it ends with memory and possibly with loss. And finally, this is a talk about representation. It looks to football as an example of an experience that's mediated by different diverging forms, from photography and live television to different layers of language, like poetry, commentary, and analysis. And then at the end, it asks, why we see art in these. Chapter two, sight. Um, so, the way I've been thinking about this is through three books. Um, can you go down an image? Basically, these three books have been the gift that keeps on giving to me. Starting again with Rosina, I see photographs everywhere. Like everyone else nowadays, they come from the world to me without my asking. They are only images. Their mode of appearance is heterogeneous. Camera will see that comes out in 1980. It's the last book that went on about twice before he dies in 1981. It's around the time that he keeps planning on writing a novel, but instead he writes this really personal text about his mother dying, and then he writes Camera will see that. 1980 is just three years after Susan Sontag publishes on photography. The first page, the first page, just think about how brilliant Susan Sontag is. In the first page, she writes, Photographs thicken the environment we recognize as modern. This line is definitely forever. Photographs thicken the environment we consider 
identity was this moment of change and whether it could even be close to the moment of change that we are living through. So before coming here today, I checked one of my favorite websites in the world, which is internetlifestats.com, which tells you how many emails are sent every second and how many Google searches are made every day. Um, so right now, or as of two days ago, 851 Instagram photos are uploaded every second. So that means about 75 million images every day. Um, and this information will like, spike within a day or within a month. And that's just on Instagram. It means that every minute we upload more images to the internet than existed 150 years ago. So think about it again. The first man who saw the first photo and the fact that today, every minute, we upload more images online than we existed around the time that photography was invented. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to think about all the time is how this proliferation of images has changed the way we look at things in the world and how we as viewers and as a society share more references, right? And I can mention a random meme or a photo of Beyonce or the, the Beyonce video that came out two days ago with Jay-Z and the Louvre and people will all know exactly what I'm talking about. That's photographs thick in the environment that we recognize as modern. We share more references. I also think that beyond the argument that Sontag makes, we have more access to visual imagery, and thus we need to like, think together about what are the things that tie us together as a community? What are the references that we share and what this means? Um, I keep talking about both photo and image, and I just want to talk to him a bit about like, my personal working definition of the difference between photo and image. And because I'm a technology scholar, my definition is really, really silly. Basically, as far as I'm concerned, an image is a JPEG. It's something that's meant to circulate. It's something that could be poor. It's something that gets auto-cropped when you upload it to Instagram. Whereas a photograph is a document. It's, a doc like, it's something that has like, a sense of intent to it. If a photographer, like the nice guy who's photographing me right now, he's going to take about 300 photographs in this talk, probably. But they'll release about three or four of these images. Those are photographs. Everything else to me is images. If you put all of them together, I will make any crazy face in each one of them because that is what I do. But they'll release a good one, and that will be the photo versus the image. And so the difference is in meaning through circulation, right? One photograph circulates as something pure with more intent, images circulate in different contexts. Um, and then the other thing I want to think about is how in that circulation, what circulates is a shared reference. And I want to argue that that shared reference is the history of art. That in today's like, crazy visual society that we live in, the photo and the image constantly meet. Um, so I'm working toward an idea of the image that's inextricable from painting, from the way we think about painting, an image that's defined by a visual literacy we all share. Okay, chapter three, Dananati. So here's, if you go down one, this is the photo that I'm obsessed with. I have been so obsessed with this, I can't even begin to describe this to you guys. So, on April 1st, 2018, so just a couple months ago, um, North London team Tottenham played a game at Stamford Bridge, which is the Chelsea Stadium. It's really important that they're both London teams. They hate each other. This is a rivalry that goes for a long time. Tottenham are good, better than Chelsea this year. Chelsea are the champions or were the champions until the end of this season. Um, but they were in a crisis, um, which for a team that's owned by a Russian oligarch, Roman Abramovich, crisis means that even though they throw so much money into their football team, they only enter the season in number five, which doesn't send it to European football. None of this matters in this context specifically. In this context specifically, you've got a scrappy young team, Tottenham, coming to Stanford Bridge. They have not won a game there since 1990. The local fans hate them. What you're seeing is Dan Alley scoring the winning goal. The game ended in a 3 1, but this is the 2 1. And this image circulated so widely. Like, what will be remembered in this game is not the fact that Tottenham won for the first time in 28 years, but will be this photograph. Um, I watched that game. I don't remember this moment at all. The next day on my Twitter, um, I followed this guy called Chris Applegate, who's a computer scientist and a tech reporter for BuzzFeed UK. He posted this photo. It got retweeted about like 10,000 times. But the post reads, the 
This photo of Dan Abney getting abused by Chelsea fans after scoring is like a giant Renaissance canvas. The more you look, the more characters and possible backstories you discover. Okay, let's go down three images quietly. So here's a great I'm actually going to talk about this, guys. Here's one image of this. Love the guy with the coffee cup. <laughs> He's just like so pronounced to his face. He's just like, look at this. I don't know what's happening. Look at the guys behind him. Remember, Daniel's wearing white and he like, looks so pure in front of them. And all the Chelsea fans are wearing dark coats because it's April and it's cold in London. Except for that like Chelsea blue that you see everywhere. Got another one down? Look at that guy. <laughs>
So he is shown to the journalists and this one photograph that became so famous um, that I couldn't find it without the Getty images like stamp on it because it's so expensive. Um, it's basically like the one that like, comes to represent the event. Can you go down one? Berger compares it to the death of Mala, the hundred of the big painting that's in the Louvre. Can you go down another one? Um, to Mantegna's The Lamentation of the Death of Christ, and then one more image. Um, Rembrandt's giving that to the lesson of Dr. Tulf. Um, and here is from Berger. Every image embodies a way of seeing, a way of seeing, even a photograph. To recognize a triangular composition in something is to recognize an order, to wade through the visual surface in the world around us and find meaning through art, through art history, through its conventions, and through its constant reappearance in our lives. But for methodology, this also became a meme. Can you go down an image? Have you all seen this image on the This was released a few weeks ago from the G7 summit in Canada. Obviously, Angela Merkel, obviously Donald Trump, the person who I have avoided referring to as President Trump every time. Um, there have been so many versions of this image taken from like basically like every member of this party comes with their own photographer, right? Like the Japanese photographer is there, the French photographer is there, the American photographer is there, photographer is there. But the one image that circulated is obviously this image, and it's not just because of the stare off. Germany and the United States, Merkel and Trump. It's because it echoes something that we recognize, like the dramatic lighting, the blue sweater and the on um, the Merkel. Like your eyes know exactly where to go. You know how to read it. You know how to read it because it's like a world painting. You know how to read it because you've seen this before. Can you go down one? This was sent to me by Adam as the curator here. Um, this is a fight in the Ukrainian parliament in 2014 that just superimposed totally perfectly with the Fibonacci spiral, which is the golden ratio, a logarithmic spiral that shows the golden ratio of a mathematical idea dating back to ancient Greece that has been influential in the way we think about aesthetics. Um, this is totally a meme, like it's such a meme that there's a no European page about this. Like, where does this start? Nobody knows. But if you go down another image, it's yeah. <laughs> appearing everywhere right now. Um, go down another image. The most famous example is this. Um, this is a photograph of you all seen this already. Ah, good. This is a photograph from New Year's Eve celebration of 2016 in Manchester. It was taken by a freelance news photographer called Joel Goodman, and it really does actually conform to the golden ratio. There's something really perfect about this. This photograph is like, it's circulated so many people go down, you can look at it without the golden ratio on it. It's circulated so widely that the Guardian wrote an article about it, and the title of the article was, It Was Like a Beautiful Painting. Um, and then the Guardian went ahead and did exactly what I'm doing here right now and asked one of its art critics to assess this photograph and why everyone has been referring to it as a beautiful painting. So here's Jonathan Jones, one of the most conservative art critics ever to exist. Please don't read him, there's bad people to read. But here goes. What a silly start to 2016 in art. For the difference between this photograph and a Renaissance painting are larger than similarities. Taking a picture is so very different to making one. All those Renaissance compositions weren't quickly shot on the street. There was nothing quick about them. Artists in those days trained for years in drawing, painting, and sculpting under exacting apprenticeship conditions. And when they did start making art of their own right, it was deeply skilled and difficult enterprise. So this is Jonathan Jones on someone makes a living being a freelance photographer who obviously studied how to photograph, who obviously thinks about composition. And I would argue, again and again, and like honing in on this point, is totally aware of Renaissance compositions and sees when they're echoed in our day-to-day -day life. And while I'm not really interested in like, I'm not, I'm not even that interested in doing the John Berger project, trying right? like matching things that look like other things, like looking at Jack and Mara and saying, this looks like a Montaigne. Um, though I really did enjoy a lot of images that were created online 
it's, it's music, it's multi-figure, go down one. And it's actually not incredibly different from the way scenes work in Oracle, right? Where, like, it's called the Hunters of the Snow, and that's, that's where your eye goes immediately. But then there's a whole other scene of like, lighting the fire by that inn. And there's the other scene of the people ice skating in the lake. There's another scene of the little horse-drawn carriage that's going to the church. My favorite is the two little old ladies there who are dragging stuff across the frozen lake. I think they're carrying stuff home or something like that. Um, and then go down another one. And this is the fight between carnival and Lent. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about what genre painting meant in the 16th century. And the way I've been thinking about it is basically in contrast to something else. Um, it's in contrast to didactic paintings of a sixth century later. So the Dutch have a tendency to do it. You know, you've seen like images of Dutch 17th century homes, you're like so neat and tidy, like paintings had to tell you how to live at that point. Can you go down one? So if you move from this party to this party, um, this is 12 night, you're probably all questioning, you know this better than me, but it's like part of Christmas. Um, and the idea is that you will look at this and know how not to celebrate Christmas. Like, don't get drunk like this woman. Um, and then I was thinking about Bruegel and Wash and thought that there's something else about those multi-figure paintings, um, which is tenderness. That they both show like a certain kind of empathy toward the subjects that they're painting. We live in a world that collapses like a lot of levity, but also a lot of despair. All you see here is actually the despair. Can you go down an image? And now look at that alley again. Um, look at the man holding a coffee cup and shouting, actually, there's also a woman holding a coffee cup right next to him. They're not together, but in my book, like, in my memoirs, that would be like, I'm being really, really romantic these days. In my book, the man holding a coffee cup and the woman holding the coffee cup at some point meet and they go, oh, you also like just drinking tea at football games around here? I love you. Are you also a Chelsea fan? That's great. We can go watch games together. Um, but I was wondering, Versions of this moment itself. 
this is part of why I'm talking about football as a way of talking about photography and about art. I think that football makes such a good example for these, for these questions because it has a really particular relationship to time. Um, though I'm a really obsessed football fan, I don't actually pay to watch any game, and I legally stream everything online, specifically because I live in the States where there, it's really hard to watch football actually. But I sit in the States and I legally stream these things, and I'm almost always chatting on, my, on the phone or texting with my buddy Harry who lives in Berlin and actually pays to watch football. And so once in a while he would text me like, Why 
has been described as a Renaissance painting, the fragile to thread that Toussaint writes about, which connects the all the time, is also an emotional thing, right? It's about memory. Like every person here who has ever seen a football game that mattered remembers everything about it. And then I was reading the philosopher Simon Critchley's book titled What We Talk About When We Talk About Football. And there was this amazing section where his friend Daisy Dunn talks about how when he was a child, he used to sit really close to the television when he was watching football because he wanted to listen to, what is his name? Kiel Kanuni, who is a very, very famous football commentator in France, who was a kind of And then Daisy Dunn says that when he used to play himself, he would commentate while playing. Think about all those images you've seen of Zidane. Um, exactly about what he was doing simultaneously, thinking about that famous moment in his mind. It was a, you were playing, wait, it's a strange thing about football, Christy writes. As a kid, where you weren't just playing, you were playing and fantasizing at the same time, distancing yourself from yourself somehow. Okay, number seven. Loneliness, the beginning of the end of this talk. Um, you know that one. So I gave this talk this tentative title that just kind of stuck with me. Is Delian lonely at all? Like, he doesn't seem lonely, right? He's too busy like, taunting the Chelsea fans, being like, I got this, and your team is losing. Um, but the tentative title of that loneliness came to me from feeling with this photo. Maybe that's the real in like, all of the versions of this photo too, exposes something about Talayadi that shouldn't be as visible as it is. But I feel like I see it in a lot of football players, and it's a sense of fragility, like something really sad and fragile about them. Here's a subject of other paintings. David. David in front of Goliath. Dead Alley in front of the screaming, shabby fans. He looks so small all of a sudden. From where I'm looking, it looks like a really lonely image. One against the many. Um, the other day, I was speaking to someone about Mo Salah and why he's so well loved. And like, the answer is not he's so well loved because he's Muslim or because he scored so many goals. What my friend said, it's just that he seems like he's living his childhood dream at every given moment. And it's so true. There's something really addictive to watching this person play. Like, he looks like a five year old. I see the child in him every time he's on the pitch. Um, sometimes when I remind myself that like, this thing that I'm obsessed with is basically watching 11 multi-millionaires chase 11 multi-millionaire other guys, is that at some point they were all five-year-old boys who dreamt about playing football. And almost everyone who watches them at some point was a five-year-old. I definitely was a five-year-old at some point, and I definitely dreamt about playing football as a child. Um, and then I wondered what that means. How sweet that is, what it means to pay that much attention to other people live. Like earlier today, I was having lunch and the game, the Portugal Morocco game started, and you looked at Ronaldo and you recognized that it's 3 p.m. here, it's 3 p.m. in Russia. Ronaldo just came out of the shower, he knows he needs to prove himself, he's under all this pressure, and I can't help but feel something like. You're in this moment with someone. You're paying attention to other human beings. And you could argue that the theater is the same, or that a music show is the same, or a dance, or listening to a live philharmonic concert, that these are all engagements with the achievement, or the skill, or the ambition of other people. And I would listen to that, and I would say, yeah, yeah, that's kind of true. But there's this one moment where I feel like I fully empathize with players except for one second. And that second is when I watch a game and someone scores a goal. But before it goes in, they always know. They seem to kick the ball and celebrate before it even goes in. Because instinctively, like, they've been there before. Instinctively, they know it's going to go in. Whereas I, in front of my television, I'm still kind of nervous. And I'm like, will it? Will it? Will it not? It did. So there's like a second in that time, in that fragile space, in which Zidane is celebrating or Ronaldo is celebrating and I can't celebrate with them just yet because I still have to wait and see. 
So that's the subject of the paintings. I talk about empathy, not David, that closeness and proximity. Um, looking again, can you tell me? Do I have the number of the I don't. Um, just keep that. Think again about the Lombard Pieta. I think about all of these different relations with the golden head. He's standing there with the Tetra and Carvalho, I think, who are both his teammates, both of them are forwards, both of them could have scored that penalty and they're comfortable in. And then I think about images that are less legible too. And what that means about paying attention to people. It's like that famous photo of Henri, it's so legible, you know exactly what just happened there. Celebrating from the local fans, you know what's up. Look at this photo. This is Bobby Moore, um, the English player, very famous in the 70s. In front of him is Pele, probably the best footballer ever to have existed. And I'm saying this only by having watched Pele play games that had happened years before I was born, in any way. This is the end of the World Cup, the two of them of the game in the World Cup. The two of them are so intimate. That photo really reminds me of images of like Marilyn Monroe when all the photographers are around her, but you recognize that she's trying to just have a moment to herself. And I look at the two of them and I look at the intimacy that they can make, and I recognize that with all of the empathy that I have toward them as a viewer, I'm never going to be able to understand them the way they understand each other, the way Lombard's teammates understand them. And I look at this again and I recognize there's one thing that you could look at this photo forever and you wouldn't know. Who won that game? Was it more or was it play? You have no idea from this photograph. It represents everything about that game, except for what actually matters. Who won? Go down. Um, just a couple last words about the shift from image into art. Um, this is a delicate it's called Coup de Tête. It's five meters high and it documents that one moment. You know this, World Cup 2006, the final, France versus Italy, minute like 118 or something. They're obviously going to go into penalties. Zidane held the team together and then that happens and he had that spark on Matarazzi. No one knows to this day what it was that Matarazzi had told him. The thing about this is that I just described all of this. You all already knew this. This is something that has like reached a level of like familiarity in our culture that's never going away. That's the stuff of art. That's the stuff of storytelling. You go one more. I'm just gonna leave that last photo behind me. Does that look familiar to all of you? This is Taylor Lane cast in bronze from that famous photo. And this is forever gonna be in front of the Emirates Stadium. Back to Susan Sontag. Photography has the unappealing reputation of being the most realistic and therefore easy of the mimetic arts. In fact, it is the one art that has managed to carry out the grandiose, century-old threat of the surrealists of taking over modern sensibility, while most of the pedigree candidates have dropped out of the race. Because we look to art to explain the world to us, right? To make an image, to fight against forgetting. And then I think about the things that we remember and how the representation of art just basically like this takes a form that we all recognize, right? Like victorious bronze sculptures, but we would have remembered it anyway. And then just down that page in Sontag, this one line, they, she talks about some painters associated with surrealism kept a long, prudent distance from surrealism's contentious idea of blurring the lines between art and so-called life, between objects and events, between the intended and the unintentional, between prose and amateurs, between the noble and the tortury, between artsmanship and lucky blunders. Of course, what I'm interested in here is that idea of so-called life. I can't find an example that's more intense of life than football. And I think what I always want to talk about today was life. Like I'm thinking about Sontag and Mott and Berger and how in less than 10 years between 1972 and 1980, between ways of seeing and Canada Lucida, each and one of them attempted to, in writing, make sense of the world around them, where vision
visuals were changing, remember Mark saying, I see photographs everywhere, like everyone else nowadays. They come from the world to me without my asking. And that relationship between art and life is what matters to me. And I think it's what is constantly being redefined because society's relationship to images has to be redefined right now. We're all scrolling on Instagram on our phones all the time. I'm thinking about the 1970s and I'm kind of wondering what the streets of London that John Merchant walked down or New York, this was in some type of lockdown or Paris that one of the walked down, even looked like. And I recognized it in this contemporary way of thinking. I try to think about New York in 
before we still went after. So we do think that like, what we're looking at is not like Frank Blackburn's goal. It's not how it's going to affect Chelsea. It's another human being. You see how being so empathetical these days. Yeah. It's like to see humanity in other people, we see it as a talking thing more than anything else. You see it in like, God, I've been trying to write an essay about screen grabs, about like those moments that you just like grab. It started because, should I be really personal? <laughs> um, I've just, I've been missing someone in New York, while well, I've been in New York, and he posts a lot of selfies, and I've just been thinking a lot of screen grabs off of Instagram of his selfies and his stories because I haven't seen him, and all of a sudden he appears. And I've been trying to think about writing as a screen grabs, about stopping something that's meant to be in motion. And part of it is because I was watching a couple of things, like I teach media studies in New York, and I was watching the Mark Zuckerberg Congress hearing with my students and talking about basically how Facebook affects their politics. And while we were watching it together, I kept taking screen grabs of Mark Zuckerberg's face. And like the moments in which he's like uncomfortable. And all of a sudden, like, there's a new empathy, or like, I feel a new empathy to what Mark Zuckerberg because when I freeze him, when I take a screenshot, I see the human being in him that I don't when he's performing to Congress, when he's like, you know, one of the congressmen was like, I just don't understand how you make money, Mr. Zuckerberg. And he's like, uh, we sell ads, Mr. Congressman. Um, and he seems so vain.
There is that amazing Susan Sontag text called On the Suffering of Others, um, which basically builds on the idea of, of photography. And the idea of photography is that to photograph something means to be a witness, and to be a witness means to not intervene. So, like, for a news photographer or a photojournalist to take a photograph during the war of a victim, it means that that person was there and maybe could have done something and could have saved that person. And that means that, in a way, they prize the document, the being witness, and to, to, to bear witness as more than to be able to help because this one image stands for many other images. This one event stands for many other events. And then, on the suffering of others, kind of expands on that idea. And Zontag talks about how there is so much suffering in the world that we can't empathize anymore, right? That you're like, if I empathize with children separated from their parents right now, can I also empathize with migrants out of school, migrant children out of Syria? Can I also empathize with migrants coming into Spain from North Africa? And that there's so much suffering, we see so much of it that we can't help but shut down. But Zontag's argument is that looking is a responsibility. And that is my argument as well. Like, I teach in police violence videos to my students because I think it's important that they look at that. And I think it's important that when they see that on Facebook Live, that they recognize that it's important that the same platform on which they look at really quickly to like see their friends' babies or whatever is also the platform from which they're going to get really important information about the society that they live in and that we should have that same like inquisitive, critical look to everything. And I don't think that peace is what changes it. I don't think the fact that like we all see so many images and scroll through them so quickly means that we don't look at them. It just means that looking has changed. And part of what I'm trying to argue in general is that the reason that this look, this like quick looking is still effective is because we've seen these images before, is because they, they echo in our minds with the history of art, they echo with something that we as a society share. And like Instagram is, like, is nothing but like lunch, pre girlfriends and sunsets. <laughs> um, and if that's what we share right now, then like, I'm fine with that because it means that like we, I'm so almost every, every one of you guys have Instagram on your phones, share something already and we share part of, like a tiny part of the, our view of the world, we understand each other, and that makes us empathetic human beings. That was, again, a really long answer to a very short question. I really had it. Yeah. Um, should, oh, yeah. So I think we're on first. Um, I have two questions, I think. The one uh, relates to the fact that most of the, I know that you are specifically It seems that more, most of the images uh, that we've seen are relatively like uh, glorious, compromised, and related success. Whereas, like most of the uh, images uh, that are related to paintings, they show that they exactly opposite uh, things like failure, dispossession, and uh, loss. So, I'm interested like, on, on the reasons why you've chosen like, these two. Like, uh, I find it like relatively contradictory, also in terms of talking about empathy. Um, I'm also going to have a tendency of like, being a small gene and uh, what the empathy means. Mm -hmm. The second is like why you've chosen like grandsons, the second part of the, of the question, and uh, perhaps like why you so, um, but like you have very good reason because of football, why, like, why, why are you like,
Um, and there, there are quite strong arguments to um, suggest that actually, currently in, in, in mm, Western politics, it's used more as a tool to kind of satiate the um, guilt of those who are privileged, uh, you know, and not actually met them with policy change, for example, or political change. And then to the extent of saying it, yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 